Uh, and this is the classic problem is of, of government is solutions uh, that get put into place don't tend to go away anytime soon. They tend to stick around. And my big fear for 2022 is that those rules that were set up are going to be very difficult to change even when the risk has been mitigated and changed. Esto es. Esto es. Esto es. La inquietud con Garrett Edwards. El lugar donde hay más preguntas que certezas. Damos vuelta de página aquí en La Inquietud por CNN Radio Rosario. Tenemos un enorme honor, placer y privilegio. Él es eh, investigador senior en el American Institute for Economic Research, AIER, en los Estados Unidos. Es doctor de la Georgia State University. Es eh, máster y licenciado de la Utah State University. Eh, antes de unirse a AIER, Tuvo posiciones académicas, eh, fue catedrático universitario en la North Dakota State University, en la Utah State University y en la Southern Utah University. Eh, también ha sido uno de los fundadores de Straight Up Policy, ha sido autor y coautor de múltiples libros, entre los cuales podemos nombrar Green vs. Green, Nature and Bound, Bureaucracy vs. the Environment, The Reality of American Energy y Politics and Quality of Life, The Role of Well-Being in Political Outcomes. También ha sido publicado en múltiples de los journals de las revistas académicas más importantes del mundo. Es un verdadero placer tenerlo con nosotros. Vamos a hablar en inglés ahora de un montón de temas, de un montón de cuestiones realmente muy interesantes, muy entretenidas. Es Ryan Young, quien está del otro lado. Ryan, so pleased to have you with us here today. How are you doing, Garrett Evers, over here? Ah, oh, thanks for having me, Garrett. It's great to chat with you, um, and I appreciate the invitation. And I appreciate you joining us today to talk about a lot of things. I mean, uh, I, I've been going through some of your recent articles, uh, some of your books. Uh, you speak a lot about public planning, about city planning, about county planning. You have studied that thoroughly uh, throughout the United States. Uh, are city planners all alike, or are they different? Do they vary? Uh, uh, so uh, once again, uh, we always start off with the city planner question and I end up in trouble regardless of how I answer it. Um, on the one hand, um, they're all very much the same. Um, to a person, uh, I can actually, I can think of one or two exceptions of city planners that I have met and gotten to know over the years that I wouldn't qualify as people trying to do what they, what their vision of good is for the world. Um, one or two, maybe wouldn't fall into that category, but uh, but generally they are folks that are looking at the world and saying, I want our communities to be better places. Unfortunately, at the same time, they all have the same sort of fatal conceit that uh, F.A. Hayek talked about, and that is the notion that somehow this time they're going to be able to just plan it exactly right and everything will work perfectly. Uh, and this hasn't been true uh, in anything. Uh, our ability to plan for all eventualities is almost impossible. Um, And uh, everyone from Jane Jacobs to F.A. Hayek to uh, <clears throat> the guy down the street who uh, complains about the potholes in the road all recognize the imperfection of the ability of planners to actually get it right. And unfortunately, almost every planner has this belief that this time they're going to get it right. This time we are going to get it right. And you talk about Hayek's fatal conceit, Ryan. And I was, I, I mean, I couldn't help think about the pandemic, which I, I guess ties nicely with how uh, communities have tried to deal with uh, everything that's been going on with uh, lockdowns, quarantines, regulations, prohibitions. Uh, how worried are you about those things uh, when it comes to, to 2022? Because 2021 is almost over. Yeah, so Garrett, we're, we're headed at the towards the end of 2021. So this is the end of almost two years of <clears throat> attempting to plan out a response to something like a pandemic. And the lesson we learn over and over again is that the best laid plans fall apart very quickly. And so uh, am I worried? Uh, only in the sense that what we continue to try to plan for, we're not going to get right. Uh, on the other hand, what I'm not worried about um, is the ability of entrepreneurs, folks working in sort of private sector who come up with responses to things like the pandemic. So if you look at our ability to respond, not just with vaccinations, although those, those were a tremendous triumph of the private sector stepping in and working closely uh, to come up with a solution, but also um, 
innovations that turn up all over the place in response to these things, including uh, jug, uh, drug development from companies um, that have also been involved in the vaccination making. But if we look back at the start of the pandemic, most of the places where um, responses started, they didn't start with government planners. They started with private businesses assessing their own risk and then responding to the demands of their customers in terms of how they manage the risk uh, early on in the pandemic. And turns out lots of places acted well before there was any sort of government mandate. Unfortunately, what's happened is we've replaced that innovation and responsiveness to the marketplace and how people are calculating their own risks with a set of rules that come from government. And those rules often don't update quickly enough to take into account the specifics of time and place as things change. Um, I look at this and say, if uh, the local business wants to wants to put a mask mandate into effect, great. They're responding to their own risk and their own customer base. Uh, but if government's going to say that everyone has to do it, well, suddenly now everybody's preferences are assumed to be the same and all risks are the same. And we're likely to see those things continue on for well past the point when any, when sort of the average person would look at it and say, this no longer makes sense for how I understand and interact with this new risk. Uh, and this is the classic problem is of, of government is solutions uh, that get put into place don't tend to go away anytime soon. They tend to stick around. And my big fear for 2022 is that those rules that were set up are going to be very difficult to change, even when the risk has been mitigated and changed. And with vaccination rates rising, at some point, COVID-19 will become endemic and it will be a risk that we manage just like every other risk. Doesn't mean it's not dangerous, doesn't mean there aren't, is, is, the risk isn't real, but it's a risk we'll have to manage. I have had the, the chance, Ryan, of attending some of your talks uh, uh, where you analyze some uh, planning problems uh, in, in specific from different counties, uh, for different towns. Uh, you, you address, for example, recently in the Berkshires, what had to do with the housing problem, which is not just a problem that, that has been taking place there in the US or for that matter in the world, because it, it, it is a problem in many, many countries. Uh, why do you think it, it is so hard for, for planners uh, to, to, to find solutions for, for problems that are actually the ones that people need solutions for? Well, it goes for it. So every time I, I have a discussion about planning, I can, I always end up right back at the same place. And that is with F.A. Hayek and his contemporaries that looked at the world and said, you know, the, even that it's not simply a matter of being able to process enough information. And this is something we almost always fall into is we could just get the information right this time and know enough, then we could solve the problem. But what's really going on is that it may not, in fact, ever be possible to do these things. And as a result, um, we, may, we don't know what we don't know. And as a result, we're left with an inability to plan for every eventuality. Now, the fortunate thing is there's already a mechanism for harnessing dispersed knowledge to try to solve these problems. Because it turns out the information is out there. It just can't be held by any one person or small group of people, but rather markets which take information and then condense it in the form of prices, let us actually figure out how do we move these things around. And as prices rise and fall, the value that people place on those things, let us know sort of how to respond. And I think this is the big problem that planners um, face is they're trying to make these sorts of decisions in the absence of clear price signals that are based on actual decisions of real people in the real world. Ryan, one of the books you co-author, Green versus Green, uh, touches upon a, an issue that I, I think it's uh, quite topical right now, at least in Argentina, when it has to do with all, all, all the regulations and changes in energy. Uh, you study the, uh, the American case over there through different kinds of, of energy sectors, and you pose a, a, a thesis that I, I'd love for, for you to, to delve a little bit further here with us today, uh, which has to do uh, with how uh, environmental law and regulations and everything is actually uh, hindering uh, those transitions and those changes when it comes to, to green energy. Yeah, I, so green versus green, as well as a couple of my other sort of research areas, focus exactly in on the question that you just laid out, Garrett. And that is that 
when we make one rule, what are the unintended, unintended consequences of that rule for everything else? And one of the things that we've seen happen consistently in renewable energy is that as soon as government selects the right sort of energy, and in the United States and increasingly around the world, that has traditionally been wind and solar production as the environmentally friendly or good energy, um, and fossil fuels as bad energy, and often nuclear gets lumped into this as well, then suddenly, then we have all sorts of unintended consequences that come from it. So we have the bad intended consequence, which is that we're gonna pick a winner, a winner and a loser in the marketplace. There are lots of good studies that explain how that goes awry. But at the same time, it means that we take away the incentive for producing new entrepreneurial ideas in the marketplace uh, because, well, if government's going to subsidize one, as they often do, that's where all capital is going to flow and getting money for the crazy idea that's going on in somebody's garage uh, never happens. And as a result, I, I remember spending some time at a wave energy um, generation startup a few years ago. And I have no idea if their technology was good or was, was environmental friendly or ever going to work. But the, the founder of that wave energy company illustrated the problem pretty clearly. And what he said was, we can't find anybody willing to invest at a large level um, because they'd, say, they'd ask us the question, well, why should I invest in you when I get a guaranteed rate of return from wind and solar and I get to be viewed as green? So all the capital flows there. At the same time, it means that it's less likely that people will be doing those things. And that's just one example of the unintended consequences. Lots of other ones flow throughout it, throughout the whole system that we pick, uh, we pick wind and solar, or we pick, we pick solar in particular, and in the West Desert of Utah, um, what, we, what do we find out? Well, it turns out there are, there are tortoises that are endangered that are harmed <laughs> by the solar. And so the trade-offs very often are hidden when we select one policy over another, rather than them being brought to the front. And when government makes that selection, those trade-offs and the realities often get get swept away. <laughs> that, 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 that's uh, amusing, Ryan. Um, I'm going to touch upon uh, another one of your books, Politics and Quality of Life, The Role of World yeah. and Political Outcomes. Uh, for I, I mean, for all your books and for all your research, you go through so many statistics. And, uh, <laughs> and as I heard you say, uh, you, you once had to go through so many town meetings uh, to, to get the information. And for this one, I mean, uh, I, I, I can imagine that it must have been a, a, a humongous, a tant amount, amount of information that you had to way through to, to, to write it because uh, you, you analyze a, a lot of indicators uh, that had to do with quality of life, that has to do with the things that government has been doing uh, on, on a municipal level or a local level or, or, or a smaller scale. And, and then you tie those uh, with, with different political behaviors, with electoral choices. Uh, and that's really interesting. Could you please tell us a little bit more about that work? Yeah, so um, one of the key things that I've always believed and that uh, when you pin an economist down, uh, what they really come down to, at least the very good economists, are they're interested in making people's lives better off or understanding what the set of circumstances are that make people's lives better. Uh, and that's at the very root of my work on, I, I call it quality of life, others call it well-being. There is a very active and utterly irrelevant academic debate over which term is correct. I use them interchangeably and it makes everyone crazy. Um, but the question is, so what does a good life look like? And is there a way to measure it? And so one of the things that I was, I'm a firm believer in is that we have subjective measures out there and there are lots of them that are very, very good. But what we didn't have in the US in particular was a measure of life quality that was based on aggregated quantitative data at sort of the, the municipality, or in the US, we call them, we, we would refer to this as county level data that aggregates small geographic areas to say, okay, what, when we look at what makes a good quality of life, things like public safety, health outcomes, education, income, what, when those things come together, what do they, what does a high quality of life first look like? And then how do different places compare? And so that work was done with an eye on. Okay, so what does a what does a high quality of life look like? So lots of sociology literature, political science literature, psychology literature came together, and then it was about calculating the differences and saying, okay, if this is real, if life quality really matters, we should expect to see 
different er different quality of life levels affecting outcomes like voting behavior, like willingness to tax um, for public goods, all those things are likely to be tied by it. And so that's the basic uh, premise. And part of it is that I'm a big believer that if we're going to claim something's important, we should be working to figure out how to measure it. And I spent a long time building out a measure um, in about another probably eight months, they'll release the 2020 US census data and it'll be time for me to recalculate <laughs> the entirety of the index. Uh, so some poor intern at AIER <laughs> is going to get handed a list of things to download from the US census and then go hand check them. So uh, if I have any future interns listening, uh, be prepared, it's gonna be data heavy. This is Ryan Young sending a message to the future just uh, <laughs> for people to be ready for that. Uh, we are gonna... Um, I, I'm going to use uh, an expression that will not translate good into English, but I like it in Spanish. We're going to take advantage of the fact that you are still with us here, Ryan. We, we have two more questions uh, uh, for for that to 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 use you and 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 get your answers. Um, you you talked about the U.S. Census, uh, and um, it, it'd be really interesting to get to get your take on on what you see happening in in, in the next. A uh, couple of years in, in the U.S. I'm not going to ask you to have a crystal ball and and and, and predict exactly what's going to happen, but I, I, if you had to to pinpoint one or two things that that you think we we from abroad should be uh, paying attention to in in the U.S., what what would you point to? Oh, so so I think there are a couple of things that are obvious uh, and relatively easy, and virtually any good political scientist in the U.S. would say the same things. Uh, one of which is there are midterm elections coming up. And elections have consequences in the US. And right now, uh, it, it certainly looks like we're likely to have a party switch in our legislative branch, and that will change some of the policy priorities. Um, regardless of whether or not the party switch happens, it, we, always, we can always see uh, what issues are going to be at the forefront by watching that electoral cycle. And so my expectation is there will be a party switch and there will be another rebalancing of the policy priorities. Uh, and the second I think is the US engagement with the rest of the world is entering a new phase. Um, Say so we had uh, a, phase, a long phase of, of engagement um, with the world. Uh, then we had a, a short run of uh, retrenchment and we're back to engagement again, but that engagement looks somewhat different. And uh, the way in which that engagement happens, particularly uh, post pandemic, I think is going to be uh, something worth watching. And so what I would say to the rest of the world is be watching the arguments going on inside the US about what that role should be, um, because that ends up, I think, having will end up mattering. And the last question, Ryan, we asked to all of our interviewees. Uh, I already told you off camera that uh, the name of the show, it's a pan in Spanish, it's called La Inquietud. And the question is, what makes Ryan Young restless? Uh, yeah, so there, there are a number of things that make me restless. Uh, the one I think that's most relevant for my work is a tendency to believe that the planning is possible in every circumstance. And the pandemic uh, response have certainly um, crystallized that debate in meaningful ways. Every time you hear someone shout out about uh, believe the science, X or Y, it says X or Y, It's a belief that that their that their plan is the right one. Those things are almost always linked, um, and so that makes me that certainly makes me restless. It should make I, I think most everyone restless, because science is about falsification, not about getting the right answer and being able to have a direct plan. Um, and the more we believe that there is an answer that's out there, the more likely we are to try to plan. And every time we try to plan at something like the societal level, that plan goes horribly and terribly awry. Uh, in my personal life, what makes me restless? Uh, eventually, I'd like the world to return to normal so that I can get back to international travel uh, and uh, working with, uh, no, with my colleagues overseas in a meaningful way. Uh, right now, it's uh, mostly I, I don't get to do that at all. Fortunately, Zoom exists, so we can have these sorts of conversations. But uh, that's my that what that's what makes me personally restless. I uh, would love to have you here in Argentina, Ryan, as soon as that's possible. Thank you, thank you very much for joining us today. Uh, thank you very much. I appreciate it, Garrett. 
we had Ryan Young here in La Inquietud. Tuvimos a Ryan Young aquí en La Inquietud por CNN Radio Rosario. Esto fue La Inquietud con Garrett Edwards. Síguenos en redes sociales y en www.edwards.com.ar